chapter 29. Freakiness of the furniture. We're in. We see how the angel, having become a man, behaves like a man, coveting another's wife and betraying his friend. In this chapter, the correctness of young Esparavu's conduct will be made in a manifest. The angel was pleasing with his lodging. He worked of a morning, went out in the afternoon heedless of detectives, and came home to sleep as in days gone by Maurice received Madame de Abel twice or thrice a week in the room which they had seen the apparition. All went very well until one morning, Gilbert, having the night before, left her little velvet bag on the table in the blue room, came to find it, and discovered arcades stretched on the couch in his pajamas, smoking a cigarette, and dreaming of the conquest of heaven. She gave a loud scream. You, Monsieur, had I thought to find you here, you might be quite sure I should not. I came to fetch my little bag, which is in the next room, allow me. And she slipped past the angel cautiously and quickly, as if he were a brazier. Madame de Abel, that morning, in her pale green tailor-made costume, was deliciously attractive. Her tight skirt displayed her movements, and her every step was one of those miracles of nature which fill men's hearts with amazement. She reappeared, bag in hand. Once more, I ask your pardon. I never dreamt that. Arcade begged her to sit down and to stay a moment. I never expected, Monsieur, she said, that you would be doing the honors of this flat. I knew how dearly Monsieur de Espavu loved you. Nevertheless, I had no idea of that. The sky had suddenly grown overcast. A brownish glare began to steal into the room. Madame de Abel told him she had walked for her health's sake, but a storm was brewing, and she asked if a carriage could be called for her. Arcade flung himself at Gilbert's feet, took her in his arms as one takes a precious piece of china, and murmured words which, being meaningless in themselves, expressed desire. She put her hands over his eyes and on his lips and exclaimed, I hate you. And shaking with sobs, she asked for a drink of water. She was choking. The angel went to her assistance. In this moment of extreme peril, she defended herself courageously. She kept saying, no, no, I will not love you. I should love you too well. Nevertheless, she succumbed. And this sweet familiarity, which followed their mutual astonishment, she said to him, I have often asked you. I knew you were an assiduous frequenter of the playhouses at Montmartre, or that you were often seen with Mademoiselle Bouchot, who nevertheless is not at all pretty. I knew that you had become very smart and that you were making a good deal of money. I was not surprised. You were born to succeed. The day of your, and she pointed to the spot between the window and the wardrobe with the mirror. Apparition, I was vexed with Maurice for having given you a suicide's rags to wear. You pleased me. Oh, it was not your good looks. Don't think that women are as sensitive as people say to outward attractions. We consider other things in love. There is a sort of, well, anyhow, I loved you as soon as I saw you. The shadows grew deeper, she asked. You are not an angel, are you? Maurice believes you are, but he believes so many things, Maurice. She questioned Arcade with her eyes and smiled maliciously. Confess that you have been fooling him and that you are no angel. Arcade replied, I only aspire to please you. I will always be what you want me to be. Gilbert decided that he was no angel, first because... One never is an angel, secondly, for more detailed reasons which drew her thoughts to the question of love. He did not argue the matter with her, and once again, words were found inadequate to express their feelings. Outside, the rain was falling thick and fast. The windows were streaming 
lighting, lightning lit up the muslin curtains, and thunder shook the panes, Gilbert made the sign of the cross, and remained with her head, hidden in her lover's bosom. At this moment, Maurice entered the room. He came in wet and smiling, confident, tranquil, happy, to announce to Arcade the good news that with his half share in the previous day's race at Long Chumps, the angel had won twelve times his stake, surprising the lady and the angel in their embrace. He became furious. Anger gripped the muscles of his throat. His face grew red with blood, and the veins stood out on his forehead. He sprang with clenched fists towards Gilbert, and then suddenly stopped. An erupting motion was transformed into heat. Maurice fumed. His anger did not harm him. Like Archelioptus, with lyrical vengeance, he merely applied an offensive epithet to his unfaithful one. Meanwhile, she had recovered her dignified bearing. She rose full of modesty and grace and gave her accuser a look which expressed both offended virtue and loving forgiveness. But as young d'Esperview continued to shower coarse and monotonous insults on her, she grew angry in her turn. You are a pretty sort of person, are you not, she said. Did I run after this arcade of yours? It was you who brought him here, and in what a state, too. You had only one idea to give me up to your friend. Well, Monsieur, you can do as you like. I'm not going to oblige you. Maurice de Espavu replied simply, Get out of it, you trollop. And he made a motion as if to push her out. It pained Arcade to see his mistress treated so disrespectfully, but he thought he lacked the necessary authority to interfere with Maurice. Madame de Abel, who had lost none of her dignity, fixed young de Espavu with her imperious gaze and said, Go and get me a carriage. So great is the power of woman over a well-bred soul in a gallant nation that the young Frenchman went immediately and told the concierge to call a taxi. Madame de Abel, with a studied exhibition of charm in every movement, took leave of them, throwing Maurice for the contemptuous look that a woman owes to him whom she has deceived. Maurice witnessed her departure with an outward expression of indifference he was far from feeling. Then he turned to the angel clad in the flowered pajamas, which Maurice himself had worn the day of the apparition. And this circumstance trifling in itself added fuel to the anger of the host, who had been thus shamefully deceived. While he said, you may pride yourself on being a despicable individual. You've behaved basely, and all for nothing. If the woman took your fancy, you had but to tell me. I was tired of her. I had enough of her. I would have willingly left her to you. He spoke thus to hide his pain, for he loved Gilbert more than ever, and the creature's treachery caused him great suffering. He pursued. I was about to ask you to take her off my hands, but you have followed your lower nature. You have behaved like a sweep. At this solemn moment, Arcade had of it spoken one word from his heart. Maurice would have burst into tears and forgiven his friend and his mistress, and all three would have become content and happy once again, but Arcade had not been nourished on the milk of human kindness, had never suffered, and did not know how to sympathize with suffering. He replied with frigid wisdom, My dear Maurice, that same necessity which orders and constrains the actions of living beings produces effects that are often unexpected and sometimes absurd. Thus it is that I have been led to displease you. You would not reproach me if you had a good philosophical understanding of nature, or you would then know that free will is but an illusion, and that physiological affinities are as exactly determined as are chemical combinations, and like them may be summed up in a formula. I think that in your case it might be possible to inculcate these truths but it would be a difficult task, and maybe they would not bring you the serenity which eludes you. It is fitting, therefore, that I should leave this spot and stay, said Maurice. Maurice had a very clear sense of social obligations. He put honor, when he thought about it, above everything. 
So now he told himself very forcibly that the outrage he had suffered could only be wiped out with blood. This traditional idea instantly lent an unexpected nobility to his speech and bearing. It is I, Monsor, he said, who will quit this place never to return. You will remain here since you are a refugee. My seconds will wait upon you. Angel smiled. I will receive them if it gives you pleasure. But bethink you, my dear Maurice, I am invulnerable. Celestial spirits, even when they are materialized, cannot be touched by point of sword or pistol shot. Consider, my dear Maurice, the awkward situation in which this fatal inequality puts me, and realize that in refusing to appoint seconds, I cannot give as a reason my celestial nature. It would be unprecedented. Monsieur, replied the heir of the Bussart d'Esperbeau, you should have thought of that before you insulted me. Out he marched haughtily, but no sooner was he in the street than he staggered like a drunken man. The rain was still falling. He walked unseen, unhearing, at haphazard, dragging his feet in the gutters through the pools of water. Through heaps of mud, he followed the outer boulevards for a long time, and at length, for done with weariness, lay down on the edge of a piece of wasteland. He was muddied up to the eyes. Mud and tears smeared his face. The brim of his hat was dripping with rain. A passerby, taking him for a beggar, tossed him a copper. He picked it up, put it carefully in his waistcoat pocket, and set off to find his seconds. Now, by angel, we mean a lot of things, right? So a demon, an angel in English, we're probably referring to the, uh, which one, uh, you know, probably referring to both when we say angel, right? Um, well, it depends on who. But they say love. And, well, giving up to impulses, and perhaps you love where those impulses are leading you, but I, I just, it, it's, it's just not how we think nowadays, or, or maybe it is, people excuse themselves left and right. Oh, if I, if I call it love, then, you know, 